What is going on, everybody? It's the France, and we're here for AEW on TNT Review for June the 17th, 2020. We are on our way to Fighter Fest, which is going to be happening July 1st and July 8th this coming month, next month. So, so far, tonight's show was to find out who was going to be the tag team champions and the number one contenders. For some reason, the National Nightmares were given a tag team title shot, even though they are the number two contenders, and who have they beat as a team? In my opinion, they haven't beaten anybody special. So why are they getting a tag team title shot before the grateful number one contenders is beyond me. And we were going to see who was going to be facing the tag team champions going into Fight or Fest as Jericho and Sammy Guevara, also known as the Sex Gods, coerced the, ta- the number one contenders into giving them a title shot by beating the brakes off of Orange Cassidy last week. The best friends won in a match against them. Jericho is like, only way that's going to happen is if you give us a t- you put your number one contendership on the line. My problem with this entire thing, first off, is you didn't put it on. We didn't get a backstage segment. We didn't get anything of why this was happening and what happened. They had to tell us on commentary what was going on. But that's not good enough. If you're going to have this happen, we need a a backstage segment where the best friends want a match with Jericho and then and, and whatever else you need to do. But so there's that. I will I will have to also mention that during the at least two matches, I believe this match and a match later on in the show, AEW for the first time ever has put out a what I want to say, put out they had a ticker below telling you the results of AEW Dark from last night. So, if you're not somebody who watches AEW Dark, you now have an inclination of who's won, who's lost, and what's going on a little bit. So, I'll give it up on them. We started the show off hot with AEW Tag Team Championship match. Kenny Omega and Hangman Page versus Dustin Rhodes and QT Marshall. Ali was not at ringside side to start this match. Because Dustin has said that, that is, she is to stay away from ringside. Now, she did come out later in the match. But honestly, having Allie disappear and not be there and then coming out later played absolutely no factor into the result of this match. So, Kenny and Dustin get started. They, Omega tries for an early one-wing angel, but nope, it's a black back elbow. Omega ends up clipping. This, this looked bad because Omega was in the corner. Um, Dustin comes to like take his they go down for one of those shoulder blocks in the corner. Omega is supposed to flip out and like avoid this. He was too late. So they ended up smashing heads and on top of that, Omega's knee ended up hitting Dustin in the head as he was flipping out of the corner. So Dustin, in my opinion, from here on out, even though he did wrestle the rest of the match, it felt like Dustin was a little off with everything that he did. So AEW's got to check, get this guy a concussion test or something because th- he just looked off from here on out. Looking a bit wildly, but still hits a hurricane runner as um, Dustin does. He takes a second in the he takes a second in the ring. Omega shakes his hand. Paige and QT both tag in. QT gets him some moves first, but then he takes a big boot to the face. QT Marshall looked great in this match. They made QT Marshall look fantastic. I mean, QT Marshall is the is the I'd say the youngest or the most greener of the four, if you want to call him green or anything. He's got the least experience. But from his teaming against the Butcher and the Blade with Cody a couple months ago in January to his teaming with Dustin Rhodes, he is coming along so well. I still don't get this whole Butcher and Blade thing breaking up and putting Ali with QT Marshall only to dick him over eventually. If they would, if they were to win the tag team titles, I could see her being the reason they lose the tag team titles because she's getting in his head, and then eventually he she, she's gonna be to him like you should be a single star. Why are you still hanging around with Dustin? And it all leads to a match at All Out between Dustin and QT Marshall. I think that's where they're going with this. Page with a couple of chomps, both end up tagging out to their partners. Road drops Omega, works him over. Marshall tags back in. Double side Russian leg sweep, both from the crown. We see Britt Baker attaching notes to a string. Apparently, she gave a note to co- to uh, she sent a note to um, Tony Schiavone saying she's isolated herself away from everybody else. And then we see 
her and her Roy Rolls Royce, her truck that says Rolls Royce on it, and she has this little pulley system so she can tack notes to them and pulley them and send them up to Tony Schiavone. Oh my goodness, Tony. Oh, oh good grief. Doesn't like his green tie, and she says something else to him later as well. Dustin continues to beat up Omega, keeping him grounded. Hits a big back body drop. Paige and Marshall get back into the ring, and Paige beats up on QT. Clothesline Rhodes off the apron, follow away slam on QT, then a double cross body splash down. Sliding clothesline on QT, cover two. Omega back in, second rope moonsault, cover two. Paige heads back in, chopped to the chest, another cheap shot to Dustin, sending him to the floor. Dustin is either a really good seller, or this guy was just completely not for a loop during that headshot earlier in the night, earlier in the match. High boot to QT, but QT with a springboard disaster kick. Can Omega and Dustin back in. Dustin with a couple clotheslines, uppercut, atomic drop, bulldog, and a pair of spinning power slams for, on both opponents. He heads up top and on the top rope and he hits a twisting senton on both guys, taking them down. He sends both to the out to the floor. QT tags in, cannonball senton on both guys. QT special over the top rope on Kenny Omega, which is. I like when Ricochet does that um, handstand springboard over top because he actually does it so fluently. When QT does it, which they call it the QT special, it feels like it's slow as can be. Hits a, um, Kenny Omega back in the ring, hits another top rope move. Kip up, looks for a diamond cutter. Um, QT looks for the diamond cutter. He actually does the diamond cutter pose um, symbol and everything. But eats a snapdragon suplex. Rhodes with the Canadian destroying on Page. Page with the clothesline, but he takes. But then he takes the diamond cutter. All four men are down. Then Ali runs out. Brandy goes to confront her, but stops on the stairs. They are cheering for QT to get up because QT is in the ring. <sighs> QT heads to the top rope, twisting moonsault, but the pool is empty. Paige tags in. He and Omega look, work over QT. Dustin tries to help, but gets tossed to the floor. Ali is still sharing Paige on. Paige with a power bomb, deep to the back of the head. Paige to the outside, takes out Dustin, back in the ring. Paige and Omega hit the last call, which is the V-Trigger Buckshot Lariat. One, two, three. Kenny Omega and Hangman Page can retain the titles. This was a fun opening match. This is the second time the tag team titles in three weeks have been defending on TV, but they have all opened the show. And honestly, it was a really good match. QT Marshall's coming along. I know that the Dustin and Co the Natural Nightmares is not a long-term tag team. This is probably the only tag team title shot they will have in this entire time that they have a tag team. So get that out of the way. We go on to Fighter Fest. Who will they face? We'll find that out later. Tonight, we will see Cody defend the TNT title against someone outside of AEW, Bailey vs. MJF, Skip Sabian and Jimmy Hamm vs. Young Bucks, Best Friends vs. The Sex Gods, when it's going on the face of Megan, and Adam Page, and Anna Jay is in action. We get a um, video package of Anna Jay talking about how she got into wrestling when she was younger. Says, once she got signed, she realized she had to work ten times harder. Says, ultimately, she wants to put on a show and give someone something for fans to remember. Hence is why she calls herself the star of the show. Anna J versus the very, very, very creepy, fiend-like character known as Abaddon. Abaddon made her AEW debut on Dark about, right, right before COVID happened, Abaddon was on Dark. She took on the current AEW Women's Champion, Hikaru Shida, in a match that Hikaru Shida, you could tell, as the match was going on, she perplexed Hikaru Shida. She just, she just like the face, the paint, the um, mat, the face paint she wears, the eye contacts. One's red, one's white. The red hair. She is creepy as hell. AEW did put out a tweet after this match happened that she is now signed with AEW. So, if you have nightmares of Abaddon. Just the way she looks and everything, she is going to be around from here on out, so get ready. Which, uh, all joking aside of anything, congratulations to Abaddon. It's kind of funny. We are in this pandemic, global pandemic bullshit that was still going on. And on April 15th, WWE fired 100 plus people. 
AEW has not fired anybody, and the actuality, they've hired people. They've signed people. They signed Anna J. They've signed Abaddon. Who knows who else of these men and women we've seen in AEW for the last few months? Who else has been signed that they haven't announced yet? FTR is all elite now. Brody Lee, Matt Hardy have all signed with AEW since um since a March fifteenth or March March eleventh. It's just funny how this company is who had yes they made a profit in April apparently or May whichever month it was, which is great, but they're not firing anybody. They're not letting anybody go. They're actually bringing people in and hiring them, and I think that's just kind of funny. Abaddon, this match was not a long match at all. Abaddon with a double leg takedown, throwing shots at Jay Anna J, then going right into the referee. Jay with some forearms in the corner, but they don't seem to do much. Abaddon with a clothesline, then chokes Anna J over the middle rope, step up in Hurricane Rana cover, and one, two, three. The match was over like that. And I'm thinking, why did you have this match then? Last time Abaddon had a match that, I, that we saw was Hikaru Shida, and it was it was a long ma- longer match than this for sure, but. And you brought Anna Jay in, who's had a couple matches back at the Nightmare Factory. And then this is her first match back, and you have her killed in mere seconds. And I'm thinking, what's going on? Why would you do that? Abaddon leaves, and then Join Dark Order comes up. JoinDarkOrder.com and the Dark Order come out. Now, they are here for two reasons. One, Mr. Brody Lee gives... Evil Uno and Stu Grayson orders to go over to Colt Cabana, who is sitting at ringside. Then they come out, they come over there, and they pick, they have this yellow envelope, or this, this, um, this envelope with the Dark Order logo on it, and they hand it to Colt Cabana. While that's going on, 10 and 5 go to the ring, and they pick up Anna Jay. They help her out of the ring, Brody Lee, um, Puts his hand out, she grabs it, and she walks off with the Dark Order. Now, the Dark Order, we've all criticized the Dark Order from the beginning because it's just, it just felt, it fell flat in the early early stages. It was just Evil Uno and Stu Grayson with a bunch of minions, and that's, honestly, if they wanted to keep it like that, that would have been fine. But they added all these elements. You had people being, you had um, John Scott, um, the, the Beaver Boys being added in. You've had Brody Lee coming in. You have five and ten. Colt Cabana looks like he might be joining the um, the Dark Order unwillingly, and now it could be Anna J. I'm gonna make this a bold prediction. By this time next year, the Dark Order could possibly have the tag team titles, the TNT title, and the women's title in their possession. The Dark Order, to me, is feeling like it's going to have some kind of dangerous alliance type um, feel to it. But done differently. Because what I mean by dangerous alliance, because dangerous alliance of Stone Cold, of, um, um, Steve, um, Steve Austin, Rick Rude, and the Brain Busters, I think it was, and a couple, and a couple others, held every championship in WCW but the World Heavyweight Championship. So possibly... They could be have that dangerous Elias type feel where they win every championship, even maybe the world heavyweight title. Maybe Brody Lee, not now, not by the not by the end of the year. Maybe coming into Double or Nothing next year, Brody Lee is your AEW heavyweight champion. Who knows? We'll have to wait and see. But the Dark Order are building up what they're going to do, and I guess every faction has to have every successful. More than three-person faction has to have a female, I guess. But that was what happened with Abaddon and Anna Jay. Abaddon is off to winning this match. I think that's her second match in AEW history. But she wins and she moves on as it looks like Anna Jay, who's only had a couple matches. So if they want to have Anna Jay be the female person in the Dark Order... I don't have a problem with it. I don't know anything of her before her time in AEW. Has she been a heel before? We'll just have to wait and see. It's going to be interesting to see what happens with Abbott, with um, with Anna J and Colt Cabana, which the envelope inside was for a contract with Brody Lee and Colt Cabana in a match next week. We'll get to the opponent later, I believe. So... <clears throat> 
we go to MJF coming out with Wardlow, and he is going to be taking on Austin, I'm sorry, Billy Gunn, who was with not just Austin, but his son Colton. If you saw last week's episode of AEW, you would have seen MJF cutting that promo after he stole the mic from Billy, and then you saw Billy with Austin in a third man, which at the time, I didn't know if it was just a friend of theirs or nothing, but if you actually watch Sammy Guevara's YouTube channel, which he does his vlogs and everything, and the gun club had the vlog while he was wrestling. The man, also known as Colton, who was sitting beside, standing beside these two, looks just like Billy. I think he looks more like Billy than Austin does, and that's, that's saying something. So, MJF comes out, and then Billy comes out with Austin and Colton. Colton heads to the back, so he was only there for a brief cameo. MJF tries to stall, he's not, he's trying to stall, heads out of the ring, gets back in, tries to Irish whip Billy, and he's just trying to Irish whip this guy, and Billy's just holding his arm, like, looking, he's like, are you kidding me, kid? Are you kidding me? And then MJF turns it into, he's like, oh, this is a good hand, this is a good sportsman shit, I'm ship, and he tries to leave, but Billy's having none of that, so he um, does a hip toss to him. MJF ends up getting a thumb to the eye, avoids some strikes, but then eats a big boot, cover two. MJF heads to the stage and walks away to the back. And Billy, the, the, the referee, the, um, Aubrey, I think it was, was started to count. Billy's like, oh, no, I got this. Walks to the back, picks MJF, puts him on his shoulder. MJ, he gets him to the ring. MJF tries to jack, like, you know, like, bring, uh, he brings Billy Gunn's neck down over the rope. But Billy Gunn does not sell this. MJF doesn't notice this. He's doing the Jarrett strut. Says, that's why I'm better than you. Jarrett, um, MJF doesn't realize that he's behind him. <sighs> Billy blocks. Um, MJF turned around and did some taunting. He ends up backing Billy in into Billy. Kick to the midsection. Famous attempt. Nope. MJF with a cheap block, chop block and another he starts working over the knee on bu a bunch to the boot to a bunch of boos. MJF continues to work over Billy until he gets shoved face first into the second turnbuckle. Throws a few punches, tilt a worse slam on M uh, MJF. Billy is hobbled though, looks for a famous sir. MJF just moves out of the way and Billy has a tough time adjusting. He runs into the corner, knee strike miss. MJF then works in a figure four. He hangs on the ropes to, for more leverage, and Aubrey kicks his hand off the rope. So he has him in that. He has him in a sort of a calf crusher. Only instead of pulling backwards, he's pushing with his foot because he's in front of him. He has. He's trying to look for the leverage. Of course, Aubrey Edwards doesn't doesn't um, sees this, doesn't like it, and actually kicks his feet back. Which of course, that's what referees who actually have some like guts actually will do. Billy ends up hitting the famous third go for the pin, but Wardlow is up on the apron for the distraction. He tosses MJF, tosses the ring to MJF and gets propped to the face by Billy. Austin tries to get involved and is killed by Wardlow. Billy goes out and throws Wardlow into the barricade. MJF waits for Billy to get back in the ring. He is just playing possum. You see the smirk on his face. He's like, I got this motherfucker. I'm going to knock his, I'm going to clean his clock and I'm going to beat him and humiliate him. And that's exactly what he does. Big punch to the face, puts the puts the evidence in his trunks, and one, two, three, MJF is your winner. Now, this was a decent match. It was okay. MJF is doing what he needs to to continue to be that dick heel who gets by by winning with by any means necessary. It's not time to beat MJF. You're not gonna have MJF went lose a match to Billy of all people. But it's after the match. They come down, they walk past Jungle Boy and them, but Jungle Boy grabs MJF's arm, turns them to him, and they start having words. So MJF, so MJF is having words with Jungle Boy, Wardlow is dealing with um, Luchasaurus and Marco Stunt, and all of them brawl, and like Marco Stunt is on top of fucking um, Wardlow just pounding away at him. Luchasaurus comes in, they start brawling. So you got yourself a brawl here. You have people, you have talent from each side of the ring coming over to try and tear these guys apart. So it finally is broken up as by the wrestlers at ringside, and that was that. It has going to lead to what we have all been looking forward to for a very long time. Luchasaurus versus Warlow next week lumberjack match. 
I do not need to see this in a Lumberjack match. I hate Lumberjack matches. Lumberjack matches in any fucking wrestling company seem to end the same. You have the match going on. Some, some chicanery shit goes happens outside. Everyone starts brawling. Somebody comes in or something happens to where the heel wins. And it's just, I don't need to see a fucking Lumberjack match. Why can't these guys just have a normal one-on-one -on -one match? I mean, come the fuck on, Tony. That's not what we need to see. We just want to see Warlow and Luchasaurus one-on-one. -on -one, no shenanigans. MJF, Jungle Boy, and Marco Stunt could be banned from ringside. Let these two beefy boys go after each other in the middle of the ring. Backstage, Alex Marvez is with Chris Jericho and Sammy Guevara about their attack on Orange Cassidy. Jericho says, everybody loves Cassidy. He doesn't care about every anything. But he interrupted the inner circle twice, and there's nothing funny about that. Guevara says they beat up, they beat him to pulp. Jericho then says they are going to do the same thing to the best friends, so they can crack the, they can give a crack at the tag team titles, and they are going to be doing that later tonight. Then we have Tony Schiavone at ringside and goes down to Britt Baker. Tony says. Hikaru Shida will defend her title against Penelope Ford at Fighter Fest, which is obvious after what happened last week with Penelope Ford beating Hikaru Shida with the help of the tie with the um, women's championship belt. This pisses off Britt Baker, and she wants she's like, "That's what you watered your way down here to tell me." Says she he's he's in a lot of shit for losing the interview with the hot with the face of the women's division. They're on a friend's timeout. She tells Reba to drive her out of there. And then the camera swings around. And it's not Reba. It's not Rebel. It's Big Swole. And what is the one line when you're in this position that you have to say? Where to? Doctor. I swear that is going to be one of the, lo the most quotable lines in professional wrestling. Of course made famous by The Undertaker saying, Where to, Stephanie? Or, Where to, Teddy? Yeah, so she goes on a nice joyride with Britt Baker in the back. We don't know where the hell she is going to take her until later in the show. We do find out later in the show that she took her to a dumpster. She literally took out the trash and threw, and somehow Britt Baker ended up inside a trash a, a trash dumpster with Rebel trying to... She was yelling at Rebel because she said it's been in there for like five hours. Rebel says, no, it's only been an hour. She gets all pissed off about that. This is late, way later in the show. I'm just going to talk about it now. And she is just like, you need to talk. You need to get Tony Schiavone out here. She's pissed off. She wants all this. She does look at the camera because there's a camera person there and says, Mix will, I will, you will regret this. As if it's the last thing I do, I will get you for this. So... Even though Britt Baker is injured, is not going to be around till probably all out. She's going. To, she's still getting time and camera time, which is fine. Cody and Arn Anderson head out to the open challenge, and then we go to commercial break. We come back, and Cody wonders last, after last week's attack. He wonders if the Nightmare, if the Elite, or if the Nightmare family is still even a family, because all that happened. There was no Cody. There was no Dustin. There was no Bucks. There was no Kenny. There was none of that. Where is the Nightmare family? They call themselves a Nightmare Family or the Elite, and honestly, the Elite slash Nightmare Family have been fragmented since the start of AEW. Like, he does say that, well, enough about this, I'm going to hand this off to the coach that is on Anderson. On Anderson says he knows Cody believes he can beat Hangar, but he also knows timing is everything and the timing is not right. Hager is watching in the back and uh, Double A says... He's got someone for Cody who can hone his skills with. They look to the big screen. And on there we see former N N NWA TV champion Mickey Starks. He introduces himself. He says once he heard about the open challenge, he thought it was the perfect way to get his opportunity. Says he slept on the floors and he's been broke. He's got grit and he knows Cody knows something about this. Two, he's ready for a fight. So we get Ricky Starks. Fresh off of his stint in the NWA a couple months ago as he left there to be a free agent so he could sign with AEW, WWE, Ring of Honor, and Impact Wrestling or anywhere else. Unfortunately, no, of course, COVID happened. So if anything, this is probably him getting his contract here unless this is a one-off. 
Cody Rhodes, May, and Cody Rhodes and, K, and Ricky Starks have put on one hell of a match tonight. Cody, I'm really liking this TV title run of his or this TNT title run of his because this dude is going out there and he had a hell of a match against Jungle Boy, a hell of a match against Mark Quinn, and then tonight he had a hell of a match against Ricky Starks. Ricky Starks is no joke. Ricky Starks is going to be, if they sign Ricky Starks to a contract, you can lump him into that group of guy, young guys who could be the future of AEW with MJF, Jungle Boy, and anybody else you can think of. Cody drops Starks, kick up Cody with his trademark uppercut, Starks with a slap to the face, which pissed Cody off. Cody swings away at the challenge, but eats some punches as well. Cody with a drop kick, Starks gets sent to the floor. Cody with a suicide died on him. Hager continues to watch the match in the back. In the ring, Cody charges and Starks launches Cody hard into the ropes. Then follows it up with a flurry of punches, leg drop on the apron, swinging DDT on Cody, cover two. Starks looks for another swinging DDT, but eats a kick. Cody with a springing, spinning body slam, cover two. Cody takes on the weight off the weight belt, tosses, looks for the crossroads, but Starks with a knee to the face. Dives in and kicks Cody. Hit, Cody hits a pancake cover two count. Cody hits the top. Hits the top. Stark gets a foot. Heads up and lands a clean superplex. Back and forth strikes. Cody looks for a disaster kick, but Starks moves out of the way and hits a beautiful spear. Roman hates your heart out because this was a devastating looking spear to Cody. Cover two. A couple of pins from each other. Cody finally catches him, hits the crossroad, planted him square on his head. One, two, three. Cody retains the TNT Championship. He will move on to Fighter Fest. Now, interestingly enough, they did not announce a match for Cody next week. So, but next week being the go-home show for Fighter Fest, I don't think they're going to have Cody defend the title next week, which I guess is kind of contradictory him saying that he is going to defend the title every week. But, hey, it is what it is. Cody shakes hands with Tom Stokes and heads out of the ring with a smile on his face. So, Cody Rhodes going on to Fighter Fest to take on Jake Hager, which I do like the fact that they did this. You get to see new talent. You get to see fresh talent or talent you haven't seen in a while. This would be also a hell of a way to bring back somebody who may be injured, which I don't know if there's any men in, injured in AEW to have come back for a big surprise. Now, Ricky Starks, I could see them maybe signing him sometime. I mean, Cody Rhodes even put him over on Twitter, calling him, like, thanking him for the match, or thanking Arn for the match. And so I believe he said that he is legit. So if they, again, if they sign Ricky Starks to a contract, AEW's future core of future talent who are going to be here for the next 10 plus years is looking fantastic. Jungle Boy, MJF, add Ricky Stokes to that. That's just, oh boy, that the AEW's got themselves a future right there. Super Bad Squad versus the Young Bucks. This was, of course, after what happened last week between the Young Bucks, FTR, the Butcher and the Blade, and the Super Bad Squad. Now, with everything that's going on with these four teams and what happened last week and what happens at the end of this match, if AEW is, I hope it's not going to be, well, we're going to do an eight-man tag match at Fighter Fest. Please, no. If you're going to do this right, give us a four-way tag team match with the winners facing the tag team champions. If you want to do this, you don't have to, but whatever. Just don't do an eight-man tag match because I don't want to see the Young Bucks and FTR teaming up. I think that would be fucking stupid. By the way, FTR seems to be playing the babyface role for now. I don't expect that to last very long. I think it's just for whatever's going on here. I can, If they do an eight-man tag team match, I fully expect to see the um, FTR turning on the Young Bucks. But anyway, the Bucks with a couple double team moves early on gets things going. By the way, um, I think it's Nick or whoever it is has his ribs still taped from a couple weeks ago from that actual legit stage dive injury. Butcher and Blade are talking trash to the Young Bucks from ringside. Matt Bruce ribs are still taped. There it is. Sabian and Havoc meet up together on the floor to regroup. Havoc and Nick in the ring. Havoc sent to the corner. Hits a net breaker with Matt hitting a flipping splash. Matt with a double drop kick on Sabian. Then a flipping net breaker on Havoc. Blade and Butcher jump the barricade to continue to draw with Matt and Nick. These two are now up on the apron as Knox is distracted by, the, by Nick. Havoc... 
I don't know where he found it, but he takes a plastic wet floor sign and sends right to the back of Nick's, right into Nick's back, which of course has the bruised ribs. So, yeah, that's that's got to feel bad. I mean, it's plastic, solid plastic on human skin, yeah, or human body, yeah. Matt is really getting worked over now, sent onto the stage, Butcher and the Blade, and Kip Sabian all make their way onto the stage, looking like we're going to get a three-on-one assault when FTR... Come out of the, this is something you got to look at too. They come out of the baby face tunnel. So they, so everyone backs off. They get into Buck's corner. Sabian punts Matt. Havoc tags in. Uppercut. Tags Sabian back in. Double team, double drop kick to the face. Matt is finally able to get a shot on Havoc. Goes for a sleeper hold in, on, in the corner, which was pretty interesting. Goes for a sleeper hold while on the top rope. Sabian looks for a hurricane runner. Matt blocks it and hits a power bomb out of the corner. Beautiful looking move. Matt finally makes his way over to Nick for the tag. Nick with a bunch of kicks to the both opponents. He is going absolutely crazy. This is a hot tag that was earned, if you know what I'm talking about, from last Monday. Or yesterday. He tries to crawl in the ring. Um, Matt with an elbow drop off the top rope. Nick brings him back to the middle of the ring. Havoc comes into the mallet with a mallet. Ford then runs in as the referee is distracted once again and gives Nick a shot to the back with the sign. By the way, Matt's bandage was well ripped off halfway through this match. Saving with a twisted DDT on Nick. Saving is bleeding either from the side, like we see Sabian. Next thing you know, we see Sabian on the turnbuckle and you see blood. Just all over his chest, around his neck, and we don't know where he's cut from. So, that looked absolutely disgusting. Matt with his Northern Light suplexes on Havoc. Nick tags in, double stomp on Havoc, down on Matt's knees. Bucks land another double team move, cover two. Young Bucks look to finish things off, Nick, but Nick is distracted by the team on the outside and gets shoved to the floor. Saving with a double stomp over Matt. Nick breaks it up. Havoc sends Nick to the out, out of the ring. Matt with a double suplex on both opponents. Nick tags in, double suplexes. This They throw Havoc into the power driver position with Sabian. They kick the knees out of Sabian's, uh, out of Sabian's, uh, out from underneath Sabian, so he power drives his own tag team partner. Double knee strikes to Sabian, the, um, uh, the Golden Lovers tag team finisher. One, two, three. And the Young Bucks are your winners. Nice match here. The Super Bad Squad are really becoming a really good tag team. I don't know. If, I, I, I've i seen Jimmy Havoc in What Culture Pro Wrestling, Defiant Wrestling, a little bit of MLW. But I've never really seen any of his under independent shows or what he does. Didn't see anything about Kip Saving before this. I don't know what their affiliation is before AEW. So just seeing this match, you can see that these guys work really well together as a tag team. They're coming together well, and honestly, I think that if you give these guys the right time, the right seasoning and everything, and you let them go out there, they would be one hell of a tag team champions when the time is right. After the match, Butcher and Blade come in. They attack the Young Bucks. FTR gets involved. One, They're both attacking the Butcher, so the Blade's still getting his shots in on the Young Bucks. And then, for some reason, I think it was um, Cash went over, Dax went over and started beating up on Jimmy Havoc while the Butcher is still attacking the Young Bucks. Now, FTR throw the, um, throw the, I think it was the Butcher into, like, into the ropes. They were looking for the Goodnight Express, but the Young Bucks come in with a double super kick. Then he bounces off the ropes and they hit a Goodnight Express again. Now, FTR lands a spike power driver on the blade while the Young Bucks do a makeshift um, Meltzer driver off the top rope onto Jimmy Havoc as well. Bucks and after the R stare down at each other for a moment and that was that. So it's like either we're getting an eight-man tag match at Photo Fest, which I really don't want to see, or we're getting a, tag, uh, a fatal four-way tag team match at Fighter Fest, which I don't know how anyone's going to feel about having the Young Bucks versus F if, the, if it was a Fatal 4-Way, how people would feel about the Young Bucks at FTR being um, in, a, in, in a match against each other without it being a one-on-one -on -one match. I, I'm probably going to see them leaning towards a eight-man tag match, which I really don't want to see, but I could see them doing that anyway. 
Earlier, to, earlier today, or earlier with this this show, by the way, was taped last week. You know how you know the show was taped last week because Excalibur was tweeting along during the entire show, and he was mentioning about ads and stuff that we saw on our TV at that time. So Excalibur kind of breaking the um, the fact that we know that this was on TV. Earlier in the day, Tyus talked about John Moxley screaming about him and Brian Cage were in their luxury. The luxury um, trailer, enjoying the protein drinks and other stuff, and then he heard this screaming and this noise outside. So he went to go look outside, and it was John Moxley. He says he's going. He's screaming and saying he's going to pop Cage's head at Fire Fest. Taz says Moxley wants to be miserable for, but for decades that was that was taken decades ago by him. He's the most miserable son of a bitch. And at Fire Fest, Cage is going to take that title from you. Cage says he wishes Fighter Fest was right now and he put Moxley down with the drill car or I would pop his head off. I don't know what I want more. To pop his head off or to drill him or to take the AEW championship. And Taz is like, which is better? It's not which, he says. Who better? There's a throat slash and that was that. When we see AEW champion John Moxley in the middle of a darkened room saying he's the man who makes heads roll but Cage does to want to take him on. Says he has demons. And the only thing that keeps them from at bay is hurting them. And hurting hurting those in the ring. Now Cage's path is crossed. Uh, our path is crossed. Beat me if you can. Survive if you're the son of a bitch. And you, if you're the tough son of a bitch. Then I'm going to take to that place. So next week on TNT, we have Sammy Guevara versus Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy does say in the next match, because he's on commentary, that Sammy Guevara will get to choose who or which version of Matt Hardy we will see next week. Brody Lee and Colt Cabana will take on the team of the Jersey Boys, Sonny Kiss and Joey Janela. I, I would say that you're trying to build up Joey Janela and Sonny Kiss, so this is going to be a match that Colt Cabana is going to take the loss. Brody Lee's not going to take the loss here. You don't have Brody Lee get pinned or submitted. You have Colt Cabana take the loss to help build that fact that he is a loser. And it builds the fact that he is going to join the Dark Order. FTR will take on Brent, um, the, night, the Natural Nightmares next week. That should be one hell of a match. Dustin Rhodes with the FTR. God damn, that should be great. John Moxley will be in action and Taz will be on commentary. So that's going to be interesting to see what happens there. Most likely, Brian Cage will be with Taz as we go. And then we get to commentary is trying to find Britt Baker. We already talked about that. And then Matt Hardy joins commentary. He is at... Um, JR asked, what version of Matt Hardy do we have tonight? Matt Hardy says, this is Unkillable Matt Hardy. If you don't remember who Unkillable Matt Hardy was, after Matt Hardy was fired in 2005. The Matt Hardy version 1 gimmick was dead. He came back and he was the Never Say Die Matt Hardy, not the unkillable Matt Hardy. So that's the Matt Hardy we had tonight. So Jericho and Sammy Guevara, well, Sammy Guevara and Jericho were coming to the ring. And while Justin Ramos was making the announcement, you could like you saw Sammy Guevara had the microphone, but he did, it wasn't on. As soon as the, the they were announced, he started singing Judas, and fortunately, we went to commercial break. I feel bad for those who was watching on Fight TV because they had to listen to all of that. The two teams pair and battle out on the floor. Trent with a big spear on Guevara, then tosses him into the ring. He plants Guevara cover to count. Jericho in the ring and goes to work on Taylor. Excalibur notes this is the first time in Jericho's career he takes on Trent and um, Chuck Taylor in any any way. Now I wonder if Trent Beretta and if Trent Beretta had a match with Jericho in WWE. I doubt it. It's, um, Trent or Taylor. Uh, Taylor in the corner. Then uh, Jericho chokes Taylor in the corner and attacks and Sammy Guevara with a drop kick kip up. Which I do like the way Sammy does the kip up because he doesn't. He just he kips up, but then he comes like when he's. Folding himself back, like when he's going back up straight, he does it really slow and like cocky, like which is awesome. Cocky pin only gets doesn't even get a one count. He's like, "This is for you, Jericho." Puts his foot on the like a Jericho on the foot on the ground, doesn't work. Max Hardy says, hey, um, "Sammy Guevara also can and will be put into that category of future stars." 
Could you imagine the future of AEW if you sign Ricky Starks? You have Jungle Boy, MJF, Sammy Guevara, Ricky Starks. That is a foursome right there in 2021 and beyond that could carry the, the could start building to carry this company in the in the years to come. Because when guys like Christopher Daniels, Chris Jericho, which Chris Jericho is going to go from the wrestling ring to the commentary booth, no doubt about it. Whether it's on the second show, Dark, or AEW on TNT. But that is where, that is where he's going to be going. But when those guys are gone, when the Young Bucks call it a career because they've been doing this for 15 plus years. When Cody says, you know what, I've had a career, I'm good. You're gonna, and they're going to be working backstage. God, those, if you sign Ricky Starks, those four guys will ca- help carry this company into the future. And that is awesome. Man, um, so Matt Hardy says he is the future of the AEW, but he is outgrown Jericho and needs to fly on his own. Jericho continues to beat up Taylor. Trent goes into the ring, beats up Sammy. Eats a draw kick, but lands a big super pla- suplex on his opponent. Trent with a baseball slide on Jericho. Trent gun goes for the splash. But earlier, when Jericho was knocked to the outside, he sneakily grabs his bat, which was on the ring apron, and pulls it down. So when Trent goes over to do a splash on the outside, the referee is distracted. Big shot to the gut by Jericho. Trent is hurting. Jericho launches Trent over the top rope. Cover two. Guevara tags in. Double sort of tackle. Guevara and Jericho with their trademark pose. Trent able to drop Guevara. He crawls his way to Taylor. Tag. Taylor knocks Jericho off the apron. Falcon Arrow. One, two, kick out. But nobody kicks out of the Falcon Arrow. That, that gimmick gets really old. I know it does. Taylor tries for a moonsault, lands on his feet, sit out power bomb, and Jericho breaks it up. Taylor dumps Jericho out of the ring. Guevara tries for a jawbreaker, looks to take out, looks to take out Jericho, looks to take him out. Jericho still down. Best friends go for the hug, but Jericho comes in and stops that. And Matt Hardy notices that these guys have a number one contendership that they earned already, and they put it on the line. They need to stay focused. They could do the hugging and stuff later, but they need to stay focused. Trent tries for a swinging DDT, but Jericho counters it into a lion tamer. Jericho Guevara flips out of the ring and drops Taylor. Trent climbs his way to the ropes and to break it up. Jericho thinks he won. Referee now, uh, ref says, now Jericho, that didn't happen. No, no, no. But Jericho's like, you suck. Ref's like, you suck. Guevara back in the ma- match. Super kick from Trent's face. And Sammy goes for the top. Trent catches him. Things are breaking down. People battling on the far. Guevara is able to is able to use the bat on Trent. Shooting star press cover two. Je- Guevara gets thrown into the ropes. Cameraman. There's a cameraman who just walks by, bumps, trips up the up Sammy Guevara, who with the distracts, Trent's able to hit the strong zero. One, two, three, and that is that. So we were wondering how is Sammy Guevara and Trish Jericho going to be screwed out of this match? How are they going to be stopped from going from winning this match? Well, that was not no no ordinary cameraman. Where has Orange Cassidy been this entire time? Now the cameraman gets up on the apron, puts his camera down, takes he has a face mask on, like one of those AEW masks, a hat, and you can't tell who it is off the top of you like immediately. But he puts it all down. Takes the hat off, takes the mask off, take, and then it turns out it's Orange Cassidy. Orange Cassidy then, when Jericho finally turns around, Jericho's like, oh, wait, whoa, 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 what the hell? And Jericho is beaten profusely by Orange Cassidy. This wasn't the, oh, I'm just going to chillax Orange Cassidy. This was, you hit me with a couple oranges and made me bleed. I'm going to fuck you up, Orange Cassidy. So he brawls with him for a bit, and Jericho finally gets out of the ring. They best friend. He takes his shirt off. He had his shirt off, they, and best friends give him his, somehow give him his jacket. I don't know where the hell they produced that from. He does his thumbs up. They hug. It was announced that at Fighter Fest it will be Chris Jericho versus Orange Cassidy. So that should be an interesting match. Jericho versus Orange Cassidy is going to be one of a kind match that. I'm sure none of us can't wait to see. So that was a very good end to the show. This show was good. The tag team title match was great. Anna Jay joining the Dark Order will be interesting to see what happens there. 
We have so much to look forward to next week. I cannot wait to see what AEW has cooking for us on the Go Home Show. We still only have a few matches for a- for Fighter Fest. I would really like to see why we need a two week episode, two week um, special show like this. Maybe we'll get a couple more matches. Right now, we have the tag team titles, the TNT title, the world title, um, the women's title, and Jericho versus Orange Cassidy. That seems like that's something you can do in a week. We'll probably have more matches announced throughout the week going into next week's show. Je- um, but yeah, that is AEW on TNT. Hit that subscribe button, comment down below, like or dislike this video. Find me on Twitter at The France Club. Find me on Twitch.tv slash The France Club. Find me on Instagram at The France Club. And I will see you guys again for SmackDown on Friday. Until then, my name is The France, and I'll see you guys later.